All right, Russ, this is the oldest trick in the back. Long term. Oh, yeah. How do we how do we break this down for people as a passive income option? I think this in, this is continuing in our our series of breaking down different passive income ideas for the audience. What is there that we need to be thinking about long term rentals? Trick in the bag? I don't think yeah. that there's any tricks in this bag, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just old school, right? It's proven. It's stable. It's the thing that's been around since. I don't know when they started renting properties, but it's been a long time. Okay, <laughs> I mean they've been renting properties as long as they've been building properties. That's right. Like right? I mean, we. I, I would imagine if you if you looked somewhere deep enough in the book of the richest man of Babylon, which is a <laughs> a, a great book, right? If you haven't read George Clayson's book, The Richest Man of Babylon, that that is a definitely to do that for you. But one of the things that he had in that book was you should turn that that gold right you should multiply that gold and one of the things that people would do is that they would take and buy assets and the goal was to get many of those gold soldiers to start coming back to them and people have done that with real estate where you buy something that is a physical item that i, I think there's a, a a misconception of what happens in real estate they would say uh, real estate appreciates Technically, that's not what's happening, right? This is nuance. But what's happening is, is that the dollar is depreciating at a faster rate than the actual physical asset. Because I don't know about you, but my air conditioner seems to get worse as every year goes on. I, I go out there to that stupid pool I have that's falling off the side of the hill. And, <laughs> you know, I got tiles popping all over the place. It's not getting better, right? It's getting worse as time goes on. But it is depreciating at a slower rate to the dollar. So usually what, but well, if we can turn that and give it to someone else to use it, then they produce income to us. Well, who as an investor, Joey, do you believe is best suited to become an owner in the real estate world, Lynn, uh, renting to long-term tenants? I think people that are data driven, right? They like a, a logical approach, a proven approach to investing. Because uh, for the for the long for the whole part of being a long term rental owner, it's kind of simple, right? The numbers are just kind of simple. Uh, it's conservative. It's low risk. If you're like that personality, you like something that's stable and proven. This is going to be your gig. I mean the. And especially if you know that you have the ability to hand it over to a management company, because that's what I love about today's podcast is we actually break down the three different areas, like from acquisition to effective management and optimizing your cash flow, and then the exit strategies. And I think contrary to popular belief, the long-term rental strategy is not a one size fits all. There's tons of different variations of each one of those. And that's what I gathered from this is that each of the coaches had their own take on it. And when I thought it was really kind of just like a one way highway, it was tons of different variations. If you like getting creative, you definitely can do it. I've seen people who've acquired hundreds of properties because they've gotten super creative in the way they buy it. And for those of you who are like, yes, but it doesn't produce enough cash flow, we'll just multiply it times 50. Right. It, it ultimately goes to your creativity, your ability to acquire more properties that it can produce cash flow. There can be a major exit. And because the dollar is a crapshoot and going down in value constantly, this can be one of those assets that holds its value against the dollar at a higher rate, which means you can pull out large amounts of money in the future. We talk a little bit about that on this podcast, yeah. too, Joey. No more. Let's jump in right now with the coaches. Pull up your chair. Let's belly up. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. 
Welcome into the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so that you can more easily understand them and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. Is this your first time joining us? Welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. They call me Chris Morgan, the idea guy. Well, it's because lack of politics guy just didn't sound so cool to me. But enough about me for a moment. Let me introduce you to my co-host, my partner. He's the Italian Stallion. He's got the license plate cover to prove it. Mr. Joe Murray. Stallion, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Russ. Uh, glad to be with you here and uh, with the rest of the inner circle doing this live podcast. Yeah, man. We're breaking down long-term rentals as a passive income strategy. Why do you think that this is so important for us to cover? Man, I think anybody who is starting their investment journey, the most natural thing, at least was for me, was to think about long-term rentals. Like that's just what people do, right? If you're going to invest. And so I think if that is the first step that you're going to take, understanding the pros, the cons, the, the good, the bad, just being better prepared, I think that's why we should spend some time on today. Okay. I love that. Well, thankfully, you and I are not the only ones going to give our opinion today. We're joined by the dream team of financial coaches to my left, literally on my left. I got a true financial Sherlock Holmes, no problem too difficult to solve. If I only known him earlier, I'd be so much richer, said everybody. Mr. Downtown, Ernie Brown, I see Ern. It is good to be seen physically <laughs> and at the physical mountain. That's right, man. Talk, talk to me a little bit about breaking down long-term rentals. Why is this so important for us? Well, I think it's really an important topic because long-term rentals can be the gateway to passive income. Mm. Gateway not, drug? You have to not, well, could be the drug. You might get addicted. Mm. Like we've, we've interviewed a few people on the podcast who would confess their addiction to long-term real estate investing. But if you understand the nature of long-term rentals, then you can understand the dynamics of any passive income, in any asset class. Totally. I, Are you going to be able to stand up behind that? I mean, that's just, that's a bold statement. I hope so. Okay. Time on the clock. All yeah. right. <laughs> 42 minutes and counting. <laughs> the wall, the clock on the wall tells me so. All right. Let's 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 get around on the virtual round table to the retiree of our group. Mr. Catch Me If You Can. He's not killing bears with his bare hands or spirit out of Fortuna. He's right here dropping gold nuggets. The one and only Mark Haraguchi. Welcome, Mark. Good afternoon. Ah. Uh, it's another day. It's another round table. And you you guys, that, that table does actually look round. It is. It is literally round. 100%. Nice. Why do you think this is an important topic today, Mark? Well, it's how I got started. So clearly it, it's the best idea out there. Because um, if I started with it, then everybody should. So I, that, that, that that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Hmm. <laughs> well, Follow Mark. Do this first. Yeah. Well, we, we, we've got another expert. I mean, we when we're talking long-term rentals, we had to bring in Mr. Ice Cold. This guy is the is the expert in the burr space. He's also he's also the the captain of the inner circle, Mr. Jeff Wagner. Good to have you on, Jeff. Burr, it's cold in here, man. So, <laughs> got thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right, well, help, help me, Jeff, understand why we should be breaking down the long-term rental space as a potential option for passive income. Well, like Joey touched on, it, it, it's something that everybody kind of thinks about initially when they think about passive income and investment opportunities. And it's something that is accessible to everybody. And there's a number of different ways to do it. So there's a way to invest in long-term rentals that sort of fits everybody's investor DNA and temperament. Nice. Okay. I I gotta be honest. I, I feel like I'm going to be the contrarian on this thing all day long, right? Because I've said the story many, many times, long-term rentals and me, not friends. You know, like, <laughs> I know, like, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it was that, that original experience, right? You have one bad experience. 
I, I didn't want to go back, man. I, I, I had this amazing deal that was not such an amazing deal. It cost me 11 years of my life. Mm. And I think it's so important for us to cover both sides of the coin, right? But, well, there's pluses, there, there, there's minuses. And as Robert Kiyosaki says, there's a third side of the coin. I want to make sure that we cover all of them. All right. But first, let me get this, give a little structure for us. Okay. Now, Jeff, I know you have been on the podcast a ton with us. So every time we do the roundtable podcast, we like to break it down into three areas. And I'll give you a chance to, to chime in, like, because as a man that has a wealth of knowledge in this space, I'm going to lean on you heavily. Okay, bro? He's like the big guns. We're going to bring in the big guns. That's right. So that's, first, that one's good. <laughs> first, I want to cover kind of how do we acquire? What's that acquisition strategy? How do we know that this actually fits in our investor buy box? Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about if we are buying them, what are some effective management strategies in order for us to optimize cash flow? Because it has to cash flow, right? The, the objective is this as a passive income strategy, not as a strategy to acquire wealth, right? There's a lot of people who say, man, I just want to invest in real estate for the wealth growth. But we want to talk about it also as a way to build passive income. Well, lastly, we got to explore exit strategy. It's got to be a way to exit. There's going to be options to exit. And we need to think about what all those options are. And I'm going to be depending heavily on you two on the internet because both of you have been investing heavily in the rental space and have thought through this way more than the Saudi has. Guaranteed. There's no doubt. All right, Mark, I'm coming to you first. Help me understand acquisition and buy box. Where should I be looking for these and how do I know if they fit and my investor my box. When I thought about this first point, the, the immediate thing that popped into mind was a story of one of my good friends who, how she figured out acquisition and buy box was she started with the goal, right? And if, if we go through our process, it's all about figuring out where are you trying to get to? So for her, she started with, how can I pay for my kid's private school? And she landed on long-term rentals turnkey long-term rentals. So her goal was, okay, well, if each one creates X amount of cash flow, then I need to purchase these so enough of these so that I can then cover the kids' schooling. And so that was her buy box. And when, when she looked at acquisition, if you looked at where we grew up, the price to play was too high. The amount of capital to invest in the state of Hawaii was not necessarily conducive to the amount of growth and structure and the ultimate goal she was trying to accomplish at that time. So that drove her buy box to look outside of the state that we were living in. And so it, you really have to take a somewhat agnostic approach and not just stick with areas that you know, but go learn about some other areas, maybe meet some other people who are doing things that you're not doing so that you can learn more. And so that, that, that's how I approach that one acquisition of buy box. You start with the goal you figure out, okay, if I know what the goal is, I know what the problem is. Now I can start to look for solutions that solve that problem. Love it. All right, Jeff, coming to you, man. As someone who's acquired 50 plus units over the years, talk a little bit about how you acquired them and how did you know that that was the thing for you to do so you could pour the gasoline on the fire? Well, I think anybody that's going into this has to first off set their mindset and expectations of what they're trying to accomplish. Okay. And be honest about where you're starting, what, what your starting point is, because, um, you know, everybody's different. Maybe, maybe you have enough capital and you want to buy a property or two just to have on the side. Maybe you have sources of private investment where it's realistic for you to go in and scale up or buy a bigger, bigger unit, multifamily or something of that nature. So I think you start with those proper expectations. Um, you asked, you know, where we started and how we did it. Uh, me and my me and my business partner, we started buying twelve years ago. Yeah, twelve years ago, and um, we initially started by pooling down payment money, and um, we did that for two properties, and we suddenly realized, well, this is going to be a very short ride because we just don't have the funds to keep that model going. And we both wanted to scale up. And so we decided, you know, we need to stretch ourselves. We need to learn how to use private money 
private investors. And it allowed us, we did that. We, we built up a pool of private investors and it allowed us to go, you know, strictly 100% Burr method on everything that we do. And, um, you know, so I think that's the important thing for everybody is, you know, set your expectation and, and go on with the, the realistic expectation of where you're trying to get to. All right. So just in case someone doesn't know what the Burr method is, I know you're the ice man and, you know, <laughs> it when you speak, but what does the Burr method actually mean to somebody that's just here for the first time? Okay. So Burr method is an acronym that was coined on bigger pockets. And it stands for buy. So you purchase your property. And in, in any case, if you're doing the burn method, what you wanna do is you wanna try and find a property <clears throat> that needs enough work or has enough room in it that you can force some appreciation into the property. That's important later and you'll understand why. The next letter in the acronym is R for um, after you purchase it, you um, are, you renovate it, okay? And that's where you're forcing appreciation. After you renovate it, you rent it to a tenant. After you have the property rented, you take it to a bank. And because of the renovation you did, you forced extra appreciation in it. You refinance it with the bank. That's your next R. And then if you've done it properly, you've increased the value enough where you can borrow enough money out to pay off your initial private lender. And then you pay them off. And the last R is repeat. So buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. Cool. As far as like thinking about how to acquire these properties, that's one strategy. Does it take a lot of your own um, assets to do that, right? It, you can borrow that from private money is what you're saying. So I just, as we're setting the stage for acquisitions, I just want to kind of break that down. Well, it, it also, Mark, you were saying like, Hey, you, you had a friend, she's realizing living in the state of Hawaii that the price of real estate was super expensive. So she had to find somewhere else to go. Now, Jeff, on your end, though, we've had this conversation on the podcast before. You literally bought in your backyard. I mean, you you were you were acquiring properties super local. And I think that that's important as you're listening to this saying, you know, maybe as I do my investor DNA, I love the idea of the steady, consistent approach to real estate. It's something I can look at for a long period of time and know what I'm going to get. There's not going to be a whole lot of ebbs and flows in that. But also to know that you can acquire real estate both locally and there's a, an efficient and effective way to do it digitally, right? In, in a remote fashion. Ern, let's talk a little bit on your end. Talk to me a little bit about acquisition and buy box as it relates to long-term rentals from your angle. Yeah, well, I think Mark said something at the at the at the very beginning is that you can take this strategy and do it in a fashion that would fit anybody's investor DNA or fit it into anybody's buy box. So uh, when I but when I think of the bread and butter long-term rental model, if for somebody's buy box, I think you stick your investor DNA very high on that list. And Russ, what you were just mentioning, how uh, simple, uh, stable, uh, relatively straightforward, uh, safe, and scalable this is, this is a great asset class and strategy uh, for someone who is uh, more careful, cautious, um, is a long-term thinker, right? Who uh, in some instances may need to be more hands-off. Now, there's a, a full discussion we could have about the personality on the other end of the spectrum and how that can be done. But if you fall into that category as a thinker and personality, this is a strategy that can fit for you. So just break that down just for a minute. The value proposition for these long-term rentals, it's fairly simple, right? You have a tenant renting your space and inside of that, what's happening is revenue is coming into your business. Uh, that is easy to calculate if it's greater than your expenses. And it's not difficult 
to then expect what long-term expenses might be needed. And so I think it's relatively simple to understand the math and the value proposition. Uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward in how to keep this going and also fairly straightforward how to scale this, right? That was Jeff's issue, but it's not hard to see how you grow your long-term rental portfolio. Simply add more units. How do you add more units? Well, I need more money to acquire or I need more strategies to acquire. And so then it's easy to figure out what's your pathway and pursue it. And then the last thing I would say is it's relatively safe. Now, this 100% is an investment, and investments by nature involve risk. But when you look at the trajectory of rental real estate property, whether it's single family or multifamily, uh, historically, it is much less volatile than the stock market. And so you can say, I have some expected uh, trajectory of this of the of the value that I get in this asset class. Stay. So, What's your take on this, right? Because we're trying to talk about different ways to acquire it. I, I almost feel like you were one of those that became an accidental long-term rental person. Yes. Um, I would not recommend my acquisition strategy, by the way. Um, bought it for a primary residence uh, in 2004 and therefore did not think of it from an investment standpoint. Had I done that, this this condo that I still own would not have quote unquote penciled because the cash flow was not there. The HOA fees and the mortgages on there were not going to be sufficient for cash flow. Um, however, for it to be used as a short term rental, so many years later, actually turned into a great thing and has been very profitable for our short term rental business. The thing I wanted to mention about you know, long-term rentals that excites me. I, overall, I'm not that excited about it because long-term rentals to me don't move the needle quick enough when people are like anxious about getting out of their nine to five, they want to move fast. These are just more steady. Like I, I think of them like the tortoise, not the hare, right? You're going to eventually over a long period of time, this is a great strategy. But if you're looking for cash flow today to, to cover your expenses, it just doesn't move the needle very quickly. Um, however, I, I don't have any experience in this, but except for just the one property that we bought this way, but creative finance to me is the, is the most in, like interesting part of ways to acquire a piece of property. But I know you, you wanted to share a little bit about that. Well, here's one of the things I would say is that you acquired your long-term rental accidentally. You said, I wouldn't have done it or wouldn't suggest others to do it. But it's only because of what you kind of followed that statement up with, that there was excess fees inside of the, the market space that you were in that did not make it a profitable situation. But I know a lot of people who have found that that to be the easiest way to get into it, right? Because an investor loan oftentimes is a more expensive, requires potentially more down payment That's right. than a traditional residential mortgage loan, right? That's right. So I know a lot of people that actually find property that they will move in, especially maybe if they're younger, right? Less children has, have acquired a lot less furniture and garbage, like, I mean, I mean uh, antiques, right? <laughs> Memorabilia, all the things that we have as, as life has continued to add on. But that is their best way to acquire the property, that they're, they're looking to find property, get in there for six months to a year, and then they turn around and go buy another property and put that one on the long-term rental market, right? They're getting the benefit of the lower down payment a lot of times, as well as potentially the lower interest rate because it's a personal home. Now, you talked about different acquisition strategies. I was just telling a, a friend of mine, they were staying at our house and we rode by the house that you and I bought in my neighborhood. And they were like, now tell me again about that. How you guys bought that? You bought that with something called subject to what exactly is that? I was like, well, one, I'm not an expert. You can go and listen to many podcasts that we've done with Pace Morgan on this very subject. But what we were able to do is purchase the property subject to their mortgage. What that meant is that we didn't assume their mortgage. Our names didn't go on the mortgage. 
their name stayed on the mortgage. We transferred deed title into our names and we made the payments for that individual. And they're like, dude, why would he, why would somebody ever do that? I was like, well, their objective was to be able to close fast and get the highest price point available to them. So by us buying it with better terms, we could close faster because we didn't have to go through all the underwriting phase that you have to do when you get a mortgage. We didn't have to pay all of those origination costs to start a new mortgage. We didn't because we were able to negotiate the deal between us. We didn't even have to pay the fees to the real estate agents in order to close the deal. So we could close faster and give them more money, but yet us on the buy side got the best deal possible. And they were like, oh, now I start to see why it makes sense for the seller. It definitely made sense for you guys. And as we sold that property, it's the only thing that saved our bacon, right? Like it's the only reason why we end up making like 40 something thousand dollars on that flip that we didn't intend to be a flip. It was because we were able to purchase it without incurring all of those excess fees. All right, let's talk a little bit though. Let's go into the next part. Let's talk about how we're going to manage it. How are we going to optimize the cash flow? Jeff, you're you're managing how many units right now? 58. 58. All right, let's talk a little bit about how do you optimize and manage 58 properties? For some people are like, oh, yeah, that's a lot. You probably have built some systems and processes. Well, so first of all, this is really where investor DNA plays a huge role because uh, I'll tell you right now, managing self-managing units isn't for everybody. Um, you know, it works out great for me and my partners because of our DNA and skill sets. But the one thing, one thing I would say is you start at the very beginning, even when you have one or two units and you have to treat it like a business, that's step one of optimizing everything that you do. If you treat it like a hobby, it's, it, you're increasing your risk of failure. The second thing that we did to, to really optimize things is, you know, Joey talked about this is, is a, a slow process. It's, it's the long game that you're playing with the, with the long-term rentals. And so we always looked at it from the perspective of, okay, we, we, we bounced up against a problem or an issue that we needed to solve. And when we did that, we thought about how are we going to solve this problem when we have or handle this problem when we have a hundred units, even if we only had like one or two or a handful of units at a time. Uh, the third thing that we, we do that's important is uh, this is a people business, no matter how much you, you know, you don't want it to be, you have to deal with the wild card and variable of people, tenants and property managers and so on. So from our perspective, whenever we have a tenant issue, we don't let it linger. It address things when it's small, inexpensive, and easy. And that helps build tenant loyalty. You know, we have tenants that have been with us for 10 years and uh, are, are happy, happy because of the service they get from us. And then um, the final thing is really stay on top of your market and your, your rent ranges and stay on top of your rent increases. Um, that's a, I think that's one of the, the reasons that people uh, get out of the business is they get behind uh, where market rents are and you know they're just not making much money on it because their expenses are growing, but they're not growing their revenue. So those are just a, a couple of things that we really look at to, um, to optimize to what we're doing. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the passive income operating system, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. 
Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30-second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. Man, that was, that was great. Thank you so much. I, I, and obviously, your expertise in this is, is super deep, and I want to I want to dig over here to you, Ern. Talk to me a little bit about kind of from your end, right? You, you, you have a, a multifamily project. How do you look at effectively managing it and then also looking to optimize its cash flow? Yep. Well, all those things that Jeff just laid out are that's, I mean, I can't improve upon that. I'd say as I thought about all those things and my goals, I realized I did not want to be the one doing that. <laughs> so I wanted to have professional property management who already was the expert in all those things, has existing processes, is willing to take their time. And I'm actually willing to trade some of my profit to pay for that, to have them manage that for me so that I can take the rest of the cash flow and manage that into other things that are going to help me accelerate my path to financial freedom. All right, here, here's where I would like to stop for just a second. So Jeff, it, I'm gonna bring both of you and Ernie into this discussion here. So you were talking about you guys, you and your business partner, because of your investor DNA, because of your skill set, decided that it made the best sense for you guys to self-manage. What are some of those things? What are some of those traits that you believe that you possess that made that a good fit for you? Well, for for those of you that know me and have worked with me for a little while, you you might see that I'm a little bit of a control freak and uh, systems guy and uh, spreadsheet numbers guy. So um, that that evolved into my role in the business, and we were blessed with a, a very complementary skill set. My partner is a real estate agent, and he's a um, interactive people person. So he does a lot of the interaction with the tenant. So it was a nice, it was a nice blend. So we've got everything covered. So that was really a, a big part of my decision making and our decision making is, you know, I guess I have weakness in a control freak. All right. What about what about you, Aaron? Well, I won't speak to me personally, but it does make me think of a lunch that I had a year ago with a friend of mine who had uh, bought, lived in a, in a home, moved out and turned that into a rental. And he was facing the same question. Do I, he, his, his DNA would make a good manager because he's fairly detail oriented, uh, is, is not going to be totally hands off or aloof. So he was juggling. I, I could be a good property manager. And actually one thing he was telling me he would want to do is be involved in the projects when things break in the house. He actually doesn't mind and would enjoy doing that. And in our conversation, I asked him some, some questions just around his interest in doing things like that. And I said, well, two options. Uh, you can pay for somebody to do those things for you, or you can do them yourself. He said, actually, I want to do those things anyways. I think that'd be a good side hustle for me to build up some more active income, do some of those projects. I said, well, Okay, great. Do you think that would be possible for you to get some of those side projects from other people, not your property, on uh, things that they want done, not need done, at times where you're available, not have to be available, and make more money doing those things than you will save if you, if you were paying a property management company? And he said, yeah, probably. I said, well, why don't we remove the things you have to do and set you loose to pursue things you want to do, make more money than you would give out otherwise. So that's just a way that I thought through with him around an investor DNA that would make sense for him to do it. But I think it's ultimately helping him pursue his financial goals much faster. Well, I mean, because this is a strat, we're talking about breaking down long-term rentals as a passive income strategy, right? Now, many people are still working an active role in some business. And if you have decided, okay, well, I'm taking that active role and either reducing it by a number of hours or eliminating it altogether, then maybe that's your active part when you're self-managing like you are, Jeff. But also for those who are working a full-time job somewhere else and thinking, well, how do I add this 
as a strategy, if active income comes in there, maybe you were creating an extra job. That's the way I think about it. I know, Mark, you, formerly a pilot, were traveling around a bunch. Were you using your your routes and, and making sure you were opting in for flights that could stop by the units that you own so that you could help, you know, change out paint colors and, and sinks and toilets and things like that? You know, shockingly, uh, those were not vacation destinations that the airline I worked for traveled to. So uh, re- regrettably uh, was, was not on the radar, but to this question of, you know, effective management to optimize cash flow. Uh, scale cost effectiveness comes from scale if you have if you're just trying to build one house you've got to buy all the lumber for that one house and for that house. If you're trying to build multiple houses you can get the costco discount you can buy pallets and get discount for for cheaper product and such and so if you're managing one sometimes you don't quite are you're not quite able to get the efficiency of scale uh, the other thing i would throw in there too is if you only have one property and that thing goes vacant, your vacancy just went to 100%. And that seems like an extremely horrible place to be. If you have two properties and one of them goes vacant because, let's face it, there's turnover. Well, now you're at 50% vacancy. It doesn't feel as bad. You're you're still losing because the, probably the remaining property isn't enough to cover the one that went vacant. But once you start getting up to three, four, five, and more, one going vacant for turnover is just part of the process and you're not losing you're just maybe trading water or you're just making a little bit less and so i think the scale starts to get in there and for me what really moved my scale and got my effective my like the management and the the optimization cash flow was the implementation of ibc because all of a sudden rather than trying to save money in one pot and then put those dollars out, they grew, and then they only had one use, I could utilize the infinite banking concept with a properly structured dividend paying mutual whole life insurance policy. And now I'm starting to get all these other efficiencies that aren't there without it. Oh, and by the way, your life insurance loan does not impact your debt to income ratio. So if you're out there worrying about DTI because you've got three, four, five, seven, eight, ten 10 mortgages in your name, and you've got all this debt against your name, all the loans you've done for the life insurance don't count against you in that regard. And so that, that's what I think really scaled my business and scaled my, my passive income. All right. I, w- I want to ask a question and I'm going to let you guys all jump into this. What can go wrong as we're trying to acquire these, as we're trying to manage these? I don't think we really have addressed that very well, right? We've talked about how we see them, maybe some other people who've had success, but what do you think are some of those things, those gotcha moments that we need to avoid? What goes wrong with trying to either acquire or to optimize and manage the units? I'm going to leave it open so that you can either talk about, you know, how you purchase them, what do you think can go wrong, or how you either self-manage or, or hand that off. Stan, you want to jump in there? I'll, I'll give you two really quick ones. If you're not purchasing the property in light of a an investment, it can go very wrong from a cash flow perspective. I I learned that the hard way, just thinking that this was a primary residence and not thinking of it as the end game. When I had to switch it to that because the market got so soft and we had to move, it just wasn't a good investment. The second thing that can go wrong is if you're like me and you literally cannot turn a screwdriver practically, self-management is not an option. Don't even go there, like don't even try. Because everything can go wrong Uh, when you try to self-manage to save a dollar here, you're going to end up spending two dollars to get it repaired. So that's that's my very limited uh, experience on that. How about for either you, Mark or or Jeff? Give give me something that can go right, but also give me something maybe that can go wrong in either one of those areas. Well, you said what can go right. If if operated correctly, this is it's a slow and steady wealth building tool. And, you know, it's, it's tried and true and proven and, you know, it, it will produce for you given enough time. What can go wrong is I think it all starts with how people approach it. And if you treat it like a hobby and a sideline, it, 
you're increasing your chances for for risk and problem. But if you if you approach it like Joey said as an investment and think of it as a business, it's going to help you get your systems and operations in place and where they need to be. Um, if you're not a self manager and you're bringing in outside management to try and free up your time, I think where a lot of people can get in trouble with that is failure to manage the manager because like I said earlier, this is a people business, whether you're dealing directly with your tenants or whether you're sandwiching a manager in between you and the tenants. If you fail to communicate and manage with one of those parties, nobody's watching the, the store and that's where things can go bad on you. So Marcus. Oof. Wow. There's so many ways it could go wrong. Uh, for example, there, I have a lawsuit in uh, an eastern seaboard state because it went so wrong. And the reason it got better was because we I stayed on top of them. It could have been a lot worse. They could have completely ran away with all the money. But instead, because I was actively managing, saying, hey, here's a timeline. What happened to this timeline? Hey, show me photos. Hey, I'm sending in my independent inspector. I don't want to trust your inspector. I want my own. And so, like Jeff said, this is a business. It's not a hobby. I think the other place that you can fall short is if you let that one bad experience dictate the rest of your experience, you could be missing out on a really good opportunity. There's always going to be a lemon that comes off the production line. It's a bummer if that's the first one you buy, but it's going to happen. And so I've, I've had two properties. I, well, I've had several properties and they've all been running good. And finally, one of them went vacant. Actually, it was it was a brand new one. And the guy didn't pay rent for 10 months because he decided that COVID was a great excuse for him to turn my brand new home that he was supposedly paying me rent for, which he didn't, into his own personal garbage dump. Mm -hmm. Now, I could let that define my long-term rental experience, or I could say, man, that's a real bummer. And that's going to happen, unfortunately. And hopefully, the management company was very forthright and communicating with me while it was going on. And we got them out as quickly as we could. But that's where this is a business. It's not a hobby. And you have to stay on top of it. And you've got to treat it as such. And you've got to, you have to manage your managers. Russ, can I interject something there? Mark, that's a great point that you brought up. You know, unfortunately that happened with you with the with the tenant, the non-paying tenant. And you know, whether somebody decides to self-manage this or they're working with a manager. Tenant screening is of paramount importance, okay? Because, you know, everybody's got a, you know, everybody has life that happens to them. And some people, unfortunately, really take advantage of that and play the game and play the system. So if you're, if you're, if you're self-managing, you know, do your due diligence on the screening. And if you have a manager, communicate with them and make sure you understand what their process is and that they're doing full due diligence for you. Ern? Yeah, I agree with all of those things. I'll just go a little bit uh, bigger, higher, some things that can go wrong over the past few years. We've seen some of this, uh, some risks that we face. If, if we're that I face that we all face owning long-term rental real estate is the threat of government uh, imposing rules, uh, whether that be um, rent ceilings, whether that be eviction moratoriums that take uh, investors out of the driver's seat of managing their businesses. The, the threat of government intervention upon businesses, that's a big risk. Another thing, it, that is more of an internal risk is how you choose to finance those things, right? We, how many how many stories are we hearing? I mean, I'm hearing a lot of investors who have chosen uh, really in a low interest rate environment, adjustable rate mortgages that are now facing <laughs> rapid increase in rates that are now moving them to a very squeezed cash flow position and potential negative cash flow position on their properties. But what can go right if you avoid those things, and this is what gets me excited, 
even though long-term rentals is a slower, more steady pace, I don't think that it's the cash flow <laughs> from these things that makes you enormously wealthy. I think it's it's the multitude of factors that go in and the opportunity to harvest the equity out of those properties to go get more rental real estate or other projects that then rapidly accelerate your pace and keeps the cash flow continuing to come in. That's a huge opportunity. And I, I was waiting for one of you guys to talk about that. One of the strategies in which you could acquire a property would be through the use of borrowing against another property, right? A property that someone else has paid down. I think another thing that didn't get mentioned here, Joey, is you didn't mention how you went from nine fifty a month in your long-term rental to eleven fifty in a month, right? How is it that you all of a sudden got an extra two hundred dollars a month from your unit that you hadn't been getting up to that point? This is cheating. What do you mean? Because you gave access to a short-term rental operator. That is true. I don't think people even think about that, right? As a long-term renter or uh, owner of rental property, there's a strategy out there that maybe you haven't even considered. There's people that have listened to our show who've said, man, rental rental arbitrage. I want to get into the short-term rental business like you two knuckleheads did, right? Where you didn't own anything. You just rented it. Yeah. Well, think about that as if you were going to buy property in an area, you don't want to be a short-term rental operator. You don't want to deal with all of that, but you are willing to allow a short-term rental operator to rent from you, put um, a, a quality product inside of your unit, which I think is a benefit, by the way. Your unit has never looked so stinking good. That is true. It, when, we, when we got that thing, it was a dog, bro. Like I think you had a room that was painted like, beige and, and another one that's painted like mauve color it was like you should it was Let's be honest it was horrendous that thing looks so money like you right now if you decided you wanted to sell it you wouldn't even have to have a photographer come and take pictures you would just take the pictures off our short-term rental ad and post them on whatever um, sites you wanted to sell them on true that's true so I think that there's an idea there if you're looking to be in the long-term rental game maybe you could buy property in a certain area that would be attractive to short-term rental operators and market specifically to the short-term rental operators. Yep. Who's talking about that? Is that something you've heard before? No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, do think they're willing to pay a premium to have access to your property because it may be a little bit more difficult for them to find that perfect place in that good location where they can operate their business. So that's a good point. All right. There, there's one for you for the idea, guys. Fair, fair okay. point. All right. Let, let's, We're almost out of time. We, we've talked about the acquisition strategy. We've talked a little bit about effective management and ways to optimize the cash flow. Let's, let's round this out with exit strategy. Jeff, you got 58 properties, you said. Clearly, you've thought through an exit strategy to this. Would you mind sharing it with us? Yeah, I have. Um, and... I, I started with the exit strategy when I put my plan together because um, years ago, prior to this portfolio, I had been involved in some multifamily uh, investments as well. I got out of those. And when we started buying in 2012, it was coming out of the recession. And, and prior to that, single family homes never really worked from a, a, from a rent standpoint and price standpoint. Well, that all changed with the with the downturn. And I decided to focus on that market because on a on an outright exit where I want to sell my properties and get out, if I'm in multifamily, I pretty much have one option. I can sell it to another investor. And investors generally don't want to pay premiums for things and so forth. But I looked at the single families and I decided that. I have essentially three exit strategies on this. I can keep my tenant in place and I can sell the property to another investor. Or I could sell it to the tenant. Or the third strategy is I could move the tenant out, fix the place up and sell it retail. So, you know, two of those options, selling to the tenant or selling at retail potentially get me a premium. And then, um, 
you know, so I looked at the multiple exit strategy and Ross, I want to touch on something you said before you, you said we hadn't really touched on the refinancing properties. I kind of classified this under exit strategy because it, there's two ways to sort of exit or benefit on your properties. One is an outright sale, but then you're dealing with capital gains and you get all of your money. But there's two ways that you can harvest your equity, which I kind of view as an as, as a pseudo exit. Um, one is a 1031 exchange where you can sell it and exchange it tax-free into another property, or you could refinance your equity out and put it into a new property. So, oh, by the way, I want to add on to that. If you're just looking at the possibility of refinancing to get access to your equity, that to me is something I've not done yet. But I think from looking at Robert Allen's book on this very subject, he talks about how if you had a property today in 10 years from now, you refinanced and got 100K, let's say, of equity out of that property, it would be the equivalent of a tax-free income from that property. And if you did that every year, bought a property every year, you could effectively create an ongoing 100K per year in tax-free income in, long, in a longevity play. And to me, that's really super interesting. Um, I think that's the best use of the tax code and it's amazing use of appreciation. And you continue that, that same cash flow because you've also been able to increase your rents along that same 10 year plan. So that to me is a really interesting one, although we haven't personally done it. It's definitely uh, a great strategy. Mark, how about for you on the exit strategy? What are some of the things and ways that you've looked at this as you've acquired real estate? Looking back in hindsight, I, I wish I would have had a little bit of a clearer vision of what my strategy was for purchasing properties and how long I wanted to hold them and then what I wanted to do with them after that term was up. But now that I'm here now, the way that I look at it is I've been using my personal cash flow system to fund all these investments, be they long-term rentals or other things. There will come a point where I'm going to unwind those long-term rentals or those other things. And when those things unwind, I will come into what Nelson liked to call a windfall. And where am I going to put that cash? I'm going to use it to repay the loans I've taken against my life insurance contract to have funded these things today. And that's going to create an even larger pool of cash so that my exit strategy is actually to take that cash, repay some of the loans that I've created, thus filling up the coffer, and then turning that life insurance contract into a future personal Mark Hargucci ATM machine to uh, fund more fishing trips, more hunting trips, more trips to Madagascar, um, you name it. That is my exit strategy. I, I love that. Jeff, you didn't get a chance. You hadn't joined yet when we had our, our Passive Income Mastermind meeting when we were in Nashville. And one of our, our members was there and he was talking about a business that he owned and how he went about exiting it. And I, I want to, I'm going to pose this to you, but I'm also posing it to anyone out there who's looking to acquire or who has already acquired a number of long-term rentals. And they're thinking, what is the exit strategy? I think this approach could apply. And you, you can tell me if it doesn't, um, Jeff, but here, here's what, okay. here's what he said. He said, you know, as I, I was building a business and I, I knew that my objective was always to sell, right? Like either you're building your business as a hobby, you're building it to sell it at some point. And he said, I knew that I wanted to sell it at some point. So what I did is I went to the market and I gave people an option to start bidding on it. And what happened along the way, he said, I, I learned many things. One, I learned who the players were in the market, who were the potential buyers for my business. So I was building relationships with it. Second thing, what, what I learned, I learned all the things that they wanted to know about my business, all of the areas, the flaws. Oh man, this, this unit, I, I would ever buy a house in this in this specific area of town because of this reason. Oh, I wouldn't want units like this because they're not easily transitioned to other buyers, whatever the thing is, right? Looking at it from a real estate standpoint, they were giving feedback. Oh, I would want to have clearer financials. I'd want to have, you know, um, regular data here. I'd really, I want to have a, a, a management company option 
right? That all the little things that the buyers would want, they're going to start telling you, right? Because what do, what do buyers do? They always start nitpicking your stuff. <laughs> they're trying to find a way right. to reduce right. its price by telling you all the things they don't like about it. And so he knew that. So he was taking that information in every single year. And then what do you think he did? He made the focus for his next 12 months to work on and improve those specific areas. So each year we came back to market. He he found out again, who are the key players? Who are the people who really were interested? And so as time went on, he improved his business to a point where the handful of people who were still in engaged with wanting to buy the company all were like, anytime you want to sell it, I'm ready. And then what do you think? Do you think that transition when he got rid of actually sell it took a long time to do or a short time? Short time. A short time, right? He didn't have to go through all those negotiations, which is what happens, right? That's going to be the biggest concern most people will have. It's like, oh man, how do I negotiate all of this? What are all the things I'm going to need to go through? Instead of preparing in advance to sell it, he had all of those things taking place. So I I don't know if that's a good idea for you as you're listening to this, and it doesn't matter if long-term rentals is your game or not. Thinking about the exit strategy in advance, not waiting until the point in which you need liquidity, (laughs) that you must have liquidity, and it's the only option to sell, because then you are in a position where you're fire selling it. As compared to you built a business that everybody else wants, you've given them exactly what they've asked for. It's going to provide the greatest premium that you could get. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. I'm grateful, uh, Stallion and Earn, that we got a chance to sit here side by side. I want to give you one last chance to give me your final thought as we wrap up this conversation. Earn, go first. There's a lot of good stuff in this in this time today, but I think it's important to to realize all the different ways that you make money in this strategy, right? It's not just the cash flow after after you pay the expenses. It's the appreciation of the property, the the equity that's building that the tenant is paying in the mortgage. It's the depreciation that you get to take against the income on those properties. And then it's the the future access to that equity as you're appreciating and the mortgage is being paid down. So a lot of ways to make money in that property. And if you just focus on the cash flow, yes, it is simple, stable, steady, safe, right? But there's there's more to that. And I think that's worth evaluating as you look at this and any other asset class. What are all the different ways that we can make money? I love that. Mark. The biggest takeaway for me was I would have never looked outside of the state of Hawaii if it hadn't have been for a tight group of friends who all wanted to talk about ways to better their lives. One of them created his own remote control car company. The other one was in long-term rentals that were turnkey over on the mainland USA. And so from those conversations, I got exposure to something that I wasn't thinking about. I wasn't thinking outside of my home state. And so that community, that feedback, that gift of sharing what's working in your area, that to me is worth way more than anything I've ever made from those short-term rentals because that led to something else, which led to something else, which just, as Joey likes to say, just raised my lid. And so that's my big takeaway. By the way, I'm going to piggyback on that before we get Jeff in here. If you're not a part of the inner circle, you have an opportunity, right? Those who are sitting here watching this live and interacting even in the chat, you have an opportunity to be a part of that. Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash free call. Jump on a call with one of these coaches because at the very least, at the minimum, what you learned today, and I'm going to go ahead and give Ernie a pat on the back, is that you learned how to think about investing in long-term real estate, potentially in a different perspective than when you came here. And that is a a skill that you need to continue to grow and be around people who challenge the way you think, because just the way you came into this show is not the way you're going to leave. That is going to be over and over and over again in these masterminds and in these small groups that we've built. And you're going to become a better investor. That's the whole goal of this is that if you become a, the best investor you can be, the opportunities will find you that will help you get to financial freedom as fast as possible. Jeff, final thought. 
Yeah. So as we've been talking here, you know, I was keeping an eye on the chat and early on, Charlie laughed and said, this is a massive topic. And he's right. We have just barely scratched the surface of, of this topic. I mean, there, and so you need to approach this continually as a student. I've been, I've been in long-term rentals for 30 plus years and I'm still learning things every day and I'm still seeking knowledge and I'm still finding new things. And so that would be my big takeaway and suggestion for people is if you are interested in this, approach it with the mindset of a student and don't ever lose, don't ever lose that. Talk to people who are doing it. There's so many different ways of doing this business that you will find something new and um, continually grow. I know I came into this with this contrarian approach, right? Maybe, maybe tone. Stallion, Always. We, we've looked at the books of, in, of banks, and we found that the number one asset that are on the bank's books are what? Life insurance. Life insurance. Cash value life insurance. The second largest item on their books are what? Real estate. Real estate. And I, I'm okay with that. Like, I, I'm thinking that. I'm like, hey, maybe I, I have to invent an idea for myself while talking on this podcast of what's going to get me excited about getting into the long-term rental space. And we've also talked that there's other options. There's options other than just long-term, just short-term. There's something called midterm rentals, which can be an option in and of itself. So I, I'm excited about what you've learned today because I know that this, as Stallion said, is maybe something that's raised your lid. If this has been valuable to you, please like, rate, review the show, share it with somebody. The way we beat the big tech algorithm is by you taking time to do that one thing for us. Thank you for listening to the episode. Have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.